So um, it's more about the pilgrims than it is Thanksgiving, but it's going to have Thanksgiving in it. And um, let's just say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, you use these pilgrims for your glory, so would you use them one more time? Use this story for your glory and touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm, I can't tell you everything about the pilgrims because first of all, I don't know everything. And second of all, there's way too much to tell. And I was like frantically cutting down this sermon so that you wouldn't hate me forever. <laughs> and, you know, and so I'm not telling you everything. And so you may say, well, I know something. Yeah, you probably do know something I'm not going to say. What I wanna focus on is why the pilgrims did what they did. And then there are a lot of miracles involved that we know never were taught in school. And I want to highlight what God did, some of the miracles that he did. And um, so it, you have to understand it all starts way back when you didn't have a Bible in the church, nobody owned a Bible, and then eventually one English Bible was placed in each church. When that happened, people wanted to read the Bible for themselves. And um, they studying the Bible and God's word with your children became extremely important to a group of people that we call Puritans. If you read the Bible, had one at your house, you could be hauled off to prison. And if you were, your wife and children were left destitute. The Puritans wanted to purify the church from within which alarmed the bishops because they knew that if you read the Bible, you would quickly recognize that bishops getting richer living in palaces while the parishioners were poor has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. It's not there. It's not the church of the Bible. And so the bishops became alarmed and they had the act of 1593 against the Puritans, which was it's illegal to be a Puritan. So if the church can't be purified, then we have to separate from the church because it's that unholy. Our pilgrims were called separatists because they felt the need to separate from the church. They believed that no king or queen could take the title head of the church because only Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So they stepped away from the church. Well, as soon as you step away from the church, you are denouncing the monarch. And that means you're committing treason. So you have to understand they were breaking the law. So once you stop going to church, you would have to fight for your survival because it was instantly noticed that you were no longer attending church and that you were going against the king. King James I let the bishops decide what to do about it, and they were not happy with the separatists, so they hounded them, bullied them, forced them to pay assessments to the Church of England. They put them in prison on trumped-up charges, and they drove them underground. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And when you hear the story of the pilgrims, it this gives this verse a whole different meaning than what we're used to. Okay, They met in private homes. Uh, they had to come at staggered intervals because they were constantly being spied on. The Our pilgrims met in a group called, uh, met in a manor called called Scrooby Manor, and it was surrounded by a moat. They met there for four years in secret by candlelight, using their children as lookouts, and then the children would one by one leave and join the worship. They reduced worship to preaching, teaching, singing, and free praying, which they were abandoning 16 centuries of established liturgical tradition. That, I mean, that was like unheard of. It sounds like our church today, doesn't it? I mean, that's, that's what we do. Thank you, pilgrims. Okay, so we can understand what's going on. And the congregation that Bradford belonged to decided they had to leave England and seek religious asylum in Holland. Once they'd shown their true colors, they really had no other choice. It's either leave England or be slaughtered. And if you are slaughtered, then your cause dies. And what they hoped was they could go to Holland, regroup, become stronger as a community of faith, and then come back to England to rescue England. That was their original plan. We'll come back to England and set our families free and set the church free and then the nation free. They um, acted 
secretly, and they had a sea captain. They, pay, they paid him to pick them up in a boat and take them over to Holland. They went to Boston, England to do this. Um, there was nowhere else in the whole world they could have gone but Holland and not be killed for their religious beliefs, which I find interesting. They walked all the way from Scroosby, 60 miles over land in the cold of September. They camped out with no tents and no sleeping bags and no fire because the searchers would already be looking for them. What they did not know was that sea captain was double dealing them. And he had made an agreement with local authorities that if he turned over the separatists to them, he would get all of their money. And the authorities, that's just what happened. They were turned into the authorities who stripped them down, took everything away from them, and threw them into jail. The women and children were set free because they were not valuable at all. And the men were kept in prison. How did the pilgrims feel about this? They felt that it was wounds and scars and lessons that God was using to teach them to prepare them for the next mission. In 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 7, it says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Remember, they depended on these scriptures. After about a month, the men were set free except for their ringleaders who were Brewster, Clifton, and Robinson, and they were not set free. They were sent to the Assize. The Assize is a court that deals with the most serious crimes, and almost every person set to the Assize was executed, but inexplicably, they were set free and told to return from whence they came. That's a miracle. I, their attitude, the pilgrim's attitude, failure is not final. So they planned another escape. We don't know where they hid out that winter, but they planned an escape with passion and enthusiasm because they knew that God had commissioned them for an assignment. In spring, they made their second attempt. This time, they would not leave from Boston. They would leave from a place that is uninhabited, and they would ask a Dutch sea captain to take them across. They even would split up. The women and children would go first along the river, and the men would find the captain, and then they would meet the women at a rendezvous point. Well, the women arrive a day too early, and they get seasick, and they're in a barge, and so they decide to row towards shore, and they get stuck in the mud. So there are all the women with all their possessions stuck in the mud in a boat. The men see the boat they're actually gonna take, and they start to board the boat, and then they'll go rescue the women. Well, the men that are on the boat see that the women are stuck, and then they see other men approaching with bill hooks to attack the women. And they cry out in alarm, and the sea captain gets scared, pulls up anchor, and heads off. That leaves the women stuck in the mud, half the men on the boat, half the men on land. And the men on land hide themselves because they realize that the women will be set free immediately and that they can't take care of them if they're put in jail. So they hide themselves, and that's what happens. The women get set free, and that, those men and women are reunited. But now we have half the men on the boat. Well, they, as soon as they hit the North Sea, the mother of all storms comes out of nowhere. And there's this huge storm, and it's so bad that the sailors have to let the sails go down and come under the decks with them and just let the ship do whatever it wants to and the water is coming into their mouths, they actually could feel the water coming through the planks. It was that bad. And the, our separatists, the, the sailors are cursing. I mean, they're, they're not godly. And the, our separatists pray out to God in the middle of the storm, even now, Lord, thou can save us. And as soon as they prayed, the storm abated, and they, were, they made it, they had been blown all the way to Norway, but they made it back to Holland, and they get off in Amsterdam. Uh, eventually, over time, the, the, they're reunited. So we have all our separatists, but first let's look at 1 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. 
Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and make you worthy of his suffering. So, you know, God used every single thing they went through to make them stronger. Eventually, all the men, women, children are all reunited in Holland. And our group from Scrooby Manor, the, who are our pilgrims, they move and go to Leiden, Holland, and they're there for 12 years. At first, they can't get jobs. They weren't part of any guild. That's why they couldn't get a job. And they had to put their children to work to, to survive. They're near penniless foreign immigrants, and they qualified only for menial labor. They had to work really hard just to subsist. But in that condition, overworked and underpaid, their hearts turned to missions. And Bradford said their life was aging them prematurely, and everyone old enough to have a job worked 12 to 15 hour days. And there was no, uh, it was so debilitating them that he was afraid that there would come a time when they would need to move and they wouldn't have the strength to. And there was also a concern because life in Holland was exciting, I guess, and it was luring the children away. They were being lured away by the world. And so they decided that they had this call for missions, that uh, they had this great hope that they could play a part if only they were stepping stones to carry the light of Christ to the remote parts of the world. So today, if you don't feel important, the pilgrims felt like, I'm just a stepping stone. If only I could be just a stepping stone. That was good enough. They believed America was where God wanted them to go. Bradford said they, they knew that their desires and actions were honorable and they would be accompanied by great difficulties. It would require a lot of courage. The dangers were great, but not desperate. The difficulties were many, but not invincible. And everything, all difficulties, might either be born or overcome through the help of God by fortitude and patience. Besides, their condition wasn't ordinary. And since their ends were good and honorable, their calling lawful and urgent, they could expect the blessings of God in their proceeding, even though they should lose their lives in the action. They would have the comfort that their endeavors were honorable. Wow, what a way to look at life. So their pastor, John Robinson, perceived that God was calling them, and he said, God's calling us to a new Jerusalem to build his temple and to use ourselves as stones. Just as God's people were called out of Babylon to go to Jerusalem to rebuild God's temple, we're called to build a spiritual Jerusalem with ourselves as lively stones for the Lord to dwell in. So they went back from Holland, they went back to England, and they hired two ships, the Mayflower and the Speedwell, to take 150 passengers across the ocean into this unknown new world. The Speedwell sprang a leak and cracked. So there wasn't enough room for all the passengers to go from England, and half of them would have, they'd have to all get onto the Mayflower. That meant half of them couldn't go and would have to stay behind. 20 willingly dropped out. Bradford said it was like Gideon's army. The small number was divided as if the Lord by this work of providence thought these, were, these few were too many for the great work he had to do. The, their pastor stayed behind because life in Holland was really hard and the people in Holland would need help. And he had to trust that the seeds he planted in the people would bear fruit for the sake of their children and their grandchildren. It's a different kind of Christian. Someone who plants seeds today, not for their own benefit, but to provide opportunity and blessing and prosperity for their children and their children's children. And they're willing to sacrifice everything now in order to give them a gift because they know they can ultimately stand on the promises of God and be victorious. John Robinson, their preacher, wrote them a letter and told them to daily renew their repentance with God. Daily renew your repentance for your sins known and generally for those sins you're committing that are unknown. And we all know we do it. Okay? And he said, sin being taken away in earnest repentance and the pardon will be security and peace in all the dangers and sweet in your distress. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, 
I live in a high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. They were to have brotherly love and forbearance and affection in their common employments, and they were to work for the general good. They were to use civil government with no person of special eminency, but choose leaders from among themselves equals who will love and promote the common good. In Romans 15, 5 through 6, it says, May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they went on the Mayflower. It was a former wine ship. It had never crossed the ocean. It had 102 passengers, about 30 crewmen, and they take off at a time when nobody in the 16th century traveled across the ocean. No one traveled in September, October, or November, and that's when they're taking off. They were in a space equal to a volleyball court. Can you imagine that? 102 pilgrims in a space the size of a volleyball court. They were in lantern-lit darkness in low ceiling between decks. The women and children were allowed to have the captain's office. The captain relinquished his office for them. No hatches could be opened because they were in continuous storms. That meant lack of light and fresh air. All non-essential personnel had to stay un under below decks. There was constant crying of children, no chance to cook meals. When and if you could eat, you lived on dried pork, dried peas, dried fish, and lemon juice to keep scurry, the scurvy away. Seven weeks or 66 days of ill-lighted rolling, pitching, and stinking. So how did they stand each other? 1 Peter 4.8, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. That's a lot of love. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 2 through 3. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, building yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. So they continued to seek God together, praying on the ship through despair and right into peace and thanksgiving. Several sailors mocked them unmercifully, and they had an appointed sailor leader who really liked to mock them. And he especially delighted in their seasickness, and he told them how much he looked forward to sewing them in shrouds and throwing them across to the fish. And he even called them psalm singing puke stockings. All right, 1 Peter 4, 12 to 14. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing the glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. At the peak of his tormenting, this sailor, the ringleader, suddenly took gravely ill of an unknown fever and died in a single day. No one else caught the mysterious fever, and he was the first body to go over the side. After this, no one mocked them. I guess not. Okay. All right. They were in mountainous seas, waves tossing the small ship, shrieking wind through the rigging. The boat had nothing to protect the water from rushing underneath. They were in between decks, which was four and a half feet high. 102 people crammed in there at a 45 degree angle, huddled together, water pouring down over your head so you are constantly wet and you have constant sickness. In Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. That's how they did it. Halfway over the ocean, the Mayflower, it rolled so far over into the sea that the crossbeam, the uh, main mast, cracked and sagged alarmingly. The ship was almost out of control. The main beam holds the ship together. It goes horizontal, but now it's cracked and coming down, and water is uh, pouring in, and the captain says, prepare to meet your God. This is it. Wow. Psalm 112, 7. 
They will have no fear of bad news. That's bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. So what did our pilgrims do? They prayed. And Brewster, one of their members, remembered that he had packed an iron, a giant iron screw. Some people say it was a screw from his printing press, and others say it was a screw that you use to get, uh, hold the bottom of the house together when you're lifting it up. Whatever kind of screw it was, he, he remembered the screw when he got it. They, they pushed it into the right place, they put a log underneath it, they twisted it in, and it saved the beam, which of course saved them from disaster. On this occasion, the sailors joined in the pilgrims in praising God and thanking him for rescuing them. On November 9th, they spotted land, but they had been blown 100 miles north of their destination. They tried to head back south, but they can't because it was too treacherous with the shoals and riptides. And so after prayer, their leaders, Brewster, Carver, Winslow, and Bradford, instruct Captain Jones to just drop anchor where you are. They were in Cape Cod. That was the best place they could be because now they are no longer under a patent to any government body because they were out of any jurisdiction. They had only the pilgrims, and you had not only pilgrims, but other crew, the crew members, and you had businessmen on board as well. And everyone had competing ideas and agendas, so they had to create a system by where they could all get along, because they needed each other. This was an act of self-government, equality, and government by the consent of the governed, the cornerstone of American democracy. It marked the first time in all of recorded history that free and equal men had voluntarily covenanted together to create their own new civil government. We call it the Mayflower Compact. So Bradford said that when they reached land, they fell on their knees and blessed the God of heaven, who brought them over the vast and furious ocean, who delivered them from the perils of it, and who set their feet on the firm earth. It was no wonder they were joyful, but they had no friends to welcome them, no inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies, no houses, and no towns to repair for help. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. They did have one Indian encounter. Uh, the Indians shot arrows at them, but no, no pilgrim was hurt. Uh, some of the men went exploring, and they found 20 acres of ground that had been cleared out, and they could tell that it had been used for corn, but it hadn't been planted in several years. And this is where they decided to set up camp. Um, had they come four years earlier, they would have been greeted um, in, by the fiercest Indian tribe called the Patuxets, and that's a hard word for me to say. But the Patuxets would have killed them on the spot if they had come four years earlier. But in 1617, they had been wiped out by the smallpox. So perhaps it was the only place that the pilgrims could have survived. Because the lives of these humble sailors had, or settlers had touched the captain so deeply, he agreed to stay as long as he possibly could with the Mayflower. And that gave them some protection, at least for the women and children. Um, they, he said they had borne even the taunts cheerfully. They had, they'd never complained about the conditions or the weather or their food, and they thanked God for the merest blessings. How could he not stay and help them? So they laid out Main Street, and they began to build a common house, but they had trouble because it was so cold. There were two or three feet of snow on the ground, and their hands were freezing, and they would drop their tools. Every night, the women and children would go a mile offshore to get on the Mayflower to sleep, but even the Mayflower was freezing, and the women would sleep on top of the children to keep them warm. So, um, and the men had to sleep on the ground in the snow until they got the common house built. And they were worried about Indians because they really thought Indians could take them out at any time. It was the time of the general sickness. Their bodies were weakened from three months at sea. They succumbed to scurvy even though they were having their daily ration of lemon juice. And they had to wade in the cold, freezing water to get to shore. And they were damp. The ground was always damp. They were overworked. And that flared into colds, which flared into consumption, which turned into pneumonia. And they didn't have the luxury of stopping when you got a cold because 
you didn't you had to have the building built as fast as possible so you have 102 people lying sick either inside this little fort they're trying to build around the mayflower and they got so sick that at one time there was only six or seven people that could actually walk the rest were lying down um, Bradford uh, was one of the ones that was sick, but Standish and Brewster and three or four others had to chop the wood to keep them warm, had to clean the sick, had to clothe them, had to cook for them, tend them. They periodically had to show themselves at the fencing, and just in case Indians happened to be watching, they didn't want the Indians to know that they were all sick. And then at night, those same six or seven who had worked hard all day had to carry the ones who had died at night to bury them into a common grave so the Indians wouldn't know how many they had lost. January 14th on a Sunday, the thatch roof of the common house caught fire and filled with smoke. They had lain as many of the sick in the common house as they possibly could get, and the burning embers fell from the roof. But some of the sick were given supernatural strength. And they took speedy action or they would have all been blown to pieces because there were barrels of gunpowder and loaded muskets in the house where they were staying. The timbers of the roof did not catch fire and the building was saved, but a lot of their clothing had burned up, which further um, made them suffer because it was a really cold winter. In Nahum 1.7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Yeah, they lost clothing, but they didn't lose their lives at that point. Right, by the end of the winter, within three months, 47 out of 102 of them are dead. The, most of the women had died. They had kept the children alive by lying on top of them. So a 13 of 18 wives died. Only three families remained unbroken. The children fared the best. Of the seven daughters, none died. Of the 13 sons, only three died. That was better than Jamestown that had an 80% to 90% mortality rate. In the midst of adversity, it, it mounted against them. They prayed harder, and they never gave in to despair. They never murmured. I find that one, that one blows me away. I'm like, I'm not a pilgrim. <laughs> so I'm, I already canceled that out. <laughs> they never murmured. They never gave in to petty jealousies that split and divide. They're, they as their ranks thinned, they drew closer together. They trusted God more. 2 Corinthians 5.1, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Their hearts remained soft to God through everything, through the death of their loved ones through everything they kept a soft heart and they said they were being tested and they they came to propagate the gospel of christ or the kingdom of christ to the remotest part of the world even if they could be just stepping stones in march the men had built the common house and, a, and they were in there, and Sama said an Indian walked down the main street and said, welcome. He boomed it out, and then he said, have you got any beer? <laughs> in flawless English. And they said, our beer is gone, but would you like brandy? They had that. And so they gave him some brandy and a biscuit and butter and cheese and pudding and a piece of roast duck, and he ate it all. And then he began to tell them he was the chief of the Algonquins. He came from Maine, and he had been visiting the area for eight months. He loved to travel, and he would beg rides with captains of ships. And he had gotten a ride with the captain, and he'd been staying. At, he'd learned his English from the fishermen that used to come into the Maine shore. And he told them the area where you're living used to belong to the Patuxets, a large, hostile tribe who would have murdered every one of you. And so they, they found that out. And he told them that their nearest Indian neighbor, well, the, uh, he told them how the Pukasets were killed by the plague, or, which we know as smallpox. And then that ever since then, the tribes kind of stay away from this area because they are afraid of it. So they're pretty free from Indians there. And their neighbors were 50 miles to the southwest, were called the Wampanoags, and their chief was Massasoit. And he had such wisdom that several smaller tribes let him lead them. And then there were the Nossets. They, lived, they were 100 warriors, and they did live on the Cape. And they hated whites because a white captain had captured seven of their Indians and sold them into slavery. 
So Samoset spent the night with them, and then he left with gifts for Massasoit, the chief. And he returned Thursday with Massasoit and an Indian named Squanto. Bradford called Squanto a special instrument sent by God for their good. Um, Squanto's life was no less extraordinary than the life of Joseph, and sold into slavery in Egypt. Squanto, guess, guess what uh, tribe he comes from? The tribe that would have killed you had you stepped on shore. He comes from the tribe that was wiped out by the plague. He's the only one left alive. In 1605, he and four Indians were captured and taken to England against their will so that they could learn English, so that they could be questioned about the new world, and they could tell who, what Indians lived where and where would be the best place to establish a colony. Squanto was stuck in England for nine years. And then he returned to his Patuxets on John Smith's voyage of 1614. Well, Squanto and 20 of the Patuxets and seven Nossets were lured aboard a ship by an evil captain who was going against his own orders, and he took them and captured them to sell them as slaves in Spain because he could get $6,000 a piece for them in today's money. So Squanto was able to return to England, and there's differing stories of how he got back to England. And once in England, he had to stay there a while, but then he found another ship captain who could take him back home. But when he came home, what did he find? Everybody's gone. Nobody left alive. He's the only one left. So he lived with Massasoit, the friendly, good Indian chief, the one who was friendly to whites. He lived with him. And when, when uh, Samoset went to tell Massasoit about this new colony, these poor people that are going to die because they, they don't know anything and they don't have anything, Squanto now has a reason to live. I can help these people, he said, and he went back. So after um, Massasoit came, Squanto helped them to make a peace treaty with the Indians that lasted over 50 years. It treated both Indians and the pilgrims equally under the law, and it was a model for treaties thereafter. Squanto came back the next day with enough eels, that as many as he could hold in his hand, and then he taught the young men how to get the eels with their feet out of the mud and capture them with their hands. I know it sounds terrible, but the pilgrims found it very tasty. <laughs> I guess. So then in April, he showed them how to plant corn the Indian way. You uh, hoeing six squares toward the center, putting down four or five kernels of corn and fertilizing them with fish. He taught them, um, they had been fishing, and they only had caught one fish in the whole time without Squanto. But Squanto knew that the fish ran, like it runs here. You know, there's walleye season, there's salmon season. Well, it's the same where the pilgrims were. And Squanto knew when the fish were going to run. And he taught them how to capture the fish, how to make a weir to capture them when they did come. And he taught them how to guard against the wolves for two weeks until the fish were decayed enough to use them as fertilizer before you plant them with the corn. He taught them how to stalk deer, how to plant pumpkin among the corn, how to refine maple syrup from trees, how to discern which herbs were good to eat and which were good for medicine, how to find the best berries, how, what a beaver pelt was, and how it was uh, a great demand in Europe. And he guided them in trading so they would get their full money's worth for the beaver pelts. The beaver pelts were their economic deliverance, and the corn was their physical deliverance. It was time for Captain Jones to leave for England, and he begged them to get on the ship and go back with him. In four weeks, they could be home. Not one person went back. Did they read Isaiah 41, 9 through 10? I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That fall provided enough that they had, uh, they had enough to see them through the second winter. They were so full of gratitude for God, for the ones that were left, to Squanto and to the Wampanoags who had been friendly to them. God had honored them beyond their dreams. So their governor, Brad, William Bradford, declared a day of public thanksgiving to be held in October. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. They invited Massasoit 
he arrives with 90 Indians. They weren't planning on feeding 90 Indians. The pilgrims had to pray really hard to keep from despair because this means that to feed the Indians is going to cut into their supply for the winter. But they had already learned how to trust God. And the Indians didn't come empty-handed. They brought five dressed deer and more than a dozen fat wild turkeys. They helped the women in the preparations. They taught women how to, ho how to make hoe cakes and tasty pudding out of cornmeal and maple syrup. They showed them how to roast kernels of corn in earthen pots until they popped. Sound familiar? OK. Right, the pilgrims provided uh, vegetables, carrots, onions, turnips, parsnips, cucumbers, radishes, beets, and cabbages. Using some of the precious flour, they used the dried fruits the Indians brought to make blueberry, apple, and cherry pies. And they had sweet wine made of wild grapes. And between meals, they played games with the Indians and the pilgrims competing in shooting contests with a gun and bow and arrow. And they were delighted that John Alden and some of the younger men of the plantation joined in foot races and wrestling. And they even had military drills staged by Captain Miles Standish. That Thanksgiving day extended to three days. Their, uh, their preacher, William Brewster, began the festival by prayer. They had a lot to be thankful for. He thanked God for providing all their needs. He thanked God for taking their loved ones home to be with him. Ooh. He thanked God for the friendship with the Indians and for bringing to them to this place and sustaining them. I can't tell you the rest of their story. They had a starving time and a drought and a miracle of answered prayer of rain. Their perspective was do the right thing over the long haul, and in the long run, God will bless it. It was a generational vision that can you can lay down your life in this wilderness, put your faces in the mud, and have your children walk on your back to a better day. A generational perspective. Um, the next part that I want to show you is um, a remembrance stone. And Pastor Rusty talked about last week of remembrance stones and monuments. And there's a monument that I discovered, and it's in Plymouth. There it is. It's called the Matrix of Liberty. It has four different sides. It's huge. You can't tell, but it is the largest granite monument in the United States. And it was built 100, over 130 years ago. It took 70 years to construct it. It was paid for by Congress and the legislature of Maine. Or Massachusetts, not Maine, sorry. It's, it's set on top of a hill, and now it's surrounded by a neighborhood. Most people don't even know about it. But the, the matrix of liberty tells you if liberty is lost in your country, this is the only way to get it back. So I kind of wanted us to look at what, how the pilgrims gained liberty for us. The large statue on the top, the very tall one, is called Faith. She points to heaven because they had faith in God and in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. And it all has to start with faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the only faith that brings true liberty. She's holding an open Geneva Bible, and she, it shows that she reads it. She reads the Bible. It doesn't matter what translation. She reads the Bible. You need a Bible. That's your faith in God. And she has a star on her forehead, and the star shows that God gives her wisdom through his word. And all the other statues underneath her are tied to her because without her, they, they mean nothing. So the first uh, statue underneath there is called morality, or we might say character. It's internal liberty. It's the beginning of all freedom. And that statue has no eyeballs. She takes it. You have to have your heart transformed first. That's where it has to start. And she's holding in her left hand the Ten Commandments, in her right hole, in her right hand, rather, the scroll of Revelation. In other words, she's holding the Bible. Okay? She has, you have to have a standard, and the Bible has to be your standard for morality. It takes an internal transformation. The pilgrims' morality started in their hearts. You have to be changed here first. The government doesn't make you a Christian. The church doesn't make you a Christian. Following the law doesn't make you a good. You have to have the Bible. Um, she has a side statue called the Evangelist, and you see a, a man with a, uh, he's, he's uh, holding a, the Gospels. And you need the Gospel, the liberating Gospel, that Christ is the one who sets us free. It rests on that. And... The next statue is called the law. And the law is, he's holding the civil law, 
in order to have a society, you have to have the principle of God's law built into our law. And he's tied to faith. And in his right hand, it's open, showing mercy, that he extends mercy. And his side statue, he has justice holding the scales of equality, that all men are treated equal under the law. And that crime, your punishment should be equally fitting to the crime. And on the other side of him is a little statue called, it's a little inlet called mercy, because you have to start with faith in the true God that produces the internal morality of the heart. And then you have the standard by which to judge what good and bad is. And then you create a moral law and you have the basis for a free and just society where you meet out equal justice for crimes. And you, but you can still extend mercy and grace to people. That gives you freedom. And if you have a stability like this, then the next statue is called education. And it's opening the education. She, it's a woman who's about 25 years old. And she's wearing a wreath of victory on her head because she has trained up her children in the way they should go. And she prepared the children so that they can prepare the next generation to come after them, how the strategy, how to get truth, how to carry on a free civilization. Um, in a little inlet on her side, you can see her training her child. And then on the other side, you, um, she's, he's holding a scroll because he's learning. And then on the other side, you see an old man because he would be the grandfather. And this represents that you, you have the hoary head, the beard. You, he's pointing to the Ten Commandments in an open Bible. He's older and wiser, and he knows the word of God. And he has a world next to him because he's teaching them, both his daughter and his grandchildren, how the world works from the biblical perspective. That's interesting. The result of strategy from the internal to the external to the law to education to liberty to the next generation. And the last statue is called Liberty, and he's like this fierce warrior. Really, I mean, he's, he's buff, okay? He looks really good. And he represents the fruit of obeying the matrix of Liberty. He's holding chains, broken chains in his left hand, and you can see where they used to be bound to his legs. He's now seated in Liberty, and he has a pleasant look on his face. He's saying, I'm free, but I'm looking out to defend my Liberty. And he has a claw on his right shoulder, and then underneath it, there's a dead lion, a lion's head. And the claw belongs to the lion, and it represents that tyranny has been defeated. And in a small statue, you can see that he's actually standing on tyranny. The pilgrims won this victory without violence of any kind. By living out godly principles, Liberty Man is protecting his families and defending the laws that they have made and ultimately defending the values of character and faith. If you do it right, you can be strong and defend liberty. If need be, you can fight, but you may not have to if you live it God's way. When we talk about pilgrims, I mean, I don't know. If I asked you, raise your hand if you think you're as good as the pilgrims. <laughs> I don't think anyone would raise their hand. I mine is down and when it, it can bring guilt like I'm not good enough I've already murmured I've already uh, complained uh, but there have been times when I might have called us you know whatever uh, I caused division by accident or uh, you know there there are things that can happen we don't feel like we measure up but instead of walking out of here guilty I would like you to walk out of here saying they were an example and that there's some area in your life that God, the Holy Spirit, might have been speaking to you. Maybe it was prayer. They depended on prayer. They prayed themselves into praise, into thanksgiving. From despair to prayer to praise to thanksgiving. When people are getting sick, when it's, I cannot imagine the smell in the Mayflower. I, I don't even want to think about it. Okay, and then they, they didn't get mad at each other. They weren't upset with each other. You've just vomited on me. They, they didn't do that. They loved each other because they, from prayer to praise to thanksgiving, because they depended on God, because they trusted in him, because what God called them to do was more important than anything. To just be a stepping stone for Jesus, to spread the gospel, to just be a stone. If I can just be a stone for God. So today, if the Holy Spirit is talking to you about maybe you need to increase your prayer life, maybe like me, you have murmured in the past. 
and uh, you want that stopped? Or perhaps um, you need to tell others about God. You realize, like, uh, I need to step up the program with my, it's too late, my children are grown, but I've got grandchildren. They need to know the Bible, and they need to know the God's view of the world. And they're being mistaught at school, and they are, and I was a teacher, and I can tell you, they are being mistaught at school. And so it's my job to teach them in the house so that when they come home from school, I can say, now let's open the word of God and let's see what God has to say and how the world has gone off, and this is how we should now do it, and this is what we believe. And in this household, we serve Jesus, whether they like it or not. So I don't... I don't know what God is doing to you inside of you. Maybe um, he's asking you to read your Bible, or maybe he pointed out a sin that we don't have to know about, but God knows, and he's pointed it out to you, and, and he wants you to deal with that this morning. So this morning, I want you to just take some time and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit show you what is it. Don't walk out of here in guilt. Don't walk out of here saying, I can't, it's too much. I can't be a pilgrim. Walk out of here with, I'm going to make a start. There's something in my life that can be changed. I can pray more. I can read my Bible more. I can teach my grandchildren. I can teach my children. There's something I can do for God. So if you'll just take a minute.